Hi everyone, you are watching the Living Beyond Austin the vlog, and this is Brittany Paula Castro. And this is part two of an interview I did with Sean last week. Um, Sean Korn, internationally recognized yoga teacher and co-founder of Off the Mat Into the World. So last week we had uh, a really awesome conversation about purpose, and this week um, I am going to just, John, ask you some questions, so welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so. Uh, the other night, right before this interview, uh, I decided to just post it on Facebook and get some buzz and get people excited, and they were very excited. And, um, and I asked them, you know, if they had a question to ask you, what would uh, the question be? And there were some really good questions, so I was like, hmm, we'll just incorporate this. Um, so I'm just going to ask you some questions. Ready? Yep, ready. Okay. So Alicia says she wants to know something about how you balance listening to your head and listening to your heart. Mm. I think that's an excellent question. Um, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of it both in my life and in my teaching because in my teaching, uh, it's always hard. My head is not in the game in any capacity. It, the skills are already there. And so for me, the more I can get out of my way, the more I'm available to my emotional life, my love, my compassion and there's a fluidity to it. It puts me right at the edge of my fear because it's so vulnerable and it's so true, but there's no uh, self-consciousness to it. And that's usually how I gauge when I'm really in my, in my heart, in my love, um, because it just feels so organic, yet not scary, but vulnerable. In life, it's a little different because I don't have the same level of self-confidence as I do when I'm in the yoga room. In life, there's going to be other things that might trip me up. And so my head will get more involved in trying to figure things out, try to anticipate what might happen, get all my ducks in a row before I make a choice. And it's a, it's a clunkier feeling um, if, it, if there was a sensation. Uh, when I listen to my heart, it's more fluid. When I'm in my head, it's more clunky. Uh, yet sometimes being in my head is helpful because it allows me to make sure that I'm being discerning, that I'm being thoughtful or mindful about the decisions that I have to make. So I don't think there's a, a better, an either or. Yeah. It's how do you be in relationship with both. And so there, for me, there are six non-negotiables mm -hmm. that allow me to stay in my body and in my heart. Those six non-negotiables are yoga, meditation, and prayer, therapy, sleep, and diet. Mm -hmm. If any one of those six things are off, odds are I will fall into old patterns of behavior that are based on my ego, on my trauma, on my fear. That'll keep me in my head. When I do these six non-negotiables, I might recognize the fear and the impulse to want to be motivated by my ego, but I'm more inclined to take a moment to sit and be in relationship with both my fear and my faith and make a conscientious choice to move towards what is more fluid in my heart, yet simultaneously being aware of the pull of my, um, my psychology. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's how I would respond to that is, uh, is I personally honor those six non-negotiables. It keeps me in my center and it allows me to make choices that are, are more in alignment with my heart. And when my head and my heart are in congruent, a congruency, the choices I make are usually in integrity. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, okay. So um, I just want to take a, like a moment with that. That was, that was a lot. Okay. Did you guys get that? <laughs> Okay, so um, the next question is from Wayne Silverman. Uh, what place should meditation have in how yoga is taught? I, huge. I mean, it's mm -hmm. critical. It's key. Um, the, first of all, the asana practice itself is an embodied meditation. Mm -hmm. And the more that the teacher understands the nuances, the subtleties of meditation, the more that that's going to be translated into the way that one teaches and also the way in which the students respond. 
all the asana practice that we do is simply to decrease the tension so that we can sit for longer periods of time without discomfort, without distraction, so as to be in a direct um, relationship with the divine. And so I practice asana so that I can sit and be more comfortable in that process. So meditation is an essential part of the whole experience, learning how to become still, how to listen to our internal dialogue, how to be emotionally, spiritually, psychologically discerning, and ultimately being in that process of self-inquiry so that we can transcend the limitations of our ego and open ourselves to spirit, although this is a long, long, long process, um, which is why meditation is a practice in the same way asana is a practice. Um, but it's an essential part of it. I wouldn't be the teacher that I am if I didn't have a meditation practice, as well as an asana practice, as well as a prayer practice. Um, and I don't think that the students would get as, as an enriched experience if I wasn't introducing themes around meditation that are essential to their own personal growth. And what is, this is my question, what is your uh, yoga meditation prayer practice look like? Mm-hmm. Well, the meditation practice that I do is called the Vipassana, okay. uh, specifically. But um, in my yoga practice, when I got on the mat, right now I'm in my yoga room, mm-hmm. and uh, where I practice is to my left, there's a spot, my altar is on this wall that you can't see. Mm-hmm. Um, and I practice directly in front of that altar. And before I practice, I, I usually go into the living room and I go on and read the news, and I find out what is going on in the world. And it doesn't take me very long to find some conflict or crisis, unfortunately. Then I come into my room, I light candles, I light my incense, and I put my palms together and I offer a prayer. And from that point forward, my practice becomes a dedication to whatever it is that's happening globally. And so I try to, um, through that prayer, put energy out, channel energy in, and then my body reflects that prayer. So the way I place my hands, the way I place my feet, how I move in and out of the poses become a meditation in action. And in that meditation, I'm 100% present. Um, So if I fall out of a pose, I'm not going to get frustrated or discouraged. I'm going to make the falling a part of the meditation. In the same way, I'm going to make washing dishes a part of the meditation. It's all a meditation. It's all presence. And so that's what my asana practice looks like every day. It's always a prayer. It's always a meditation. The asana itself is secondary to the offering. And and with that, I know that there's byproducts. I'll get stronger, more flexible. You know, that, that's just going to happen organically. But I also know that I can serve something bigger than myself. And so the that meditation is an essential part of my asana practice. And then it leads me to sitting still and practicing vipassana and going into the sensations of my own body and cultivating that inner awareness. And hopefully these practices set me up so that I want, when I leave this room, the sanctuary of this space, and I'm confronted with life, that I'm able to manage life a little bit more skillfully, um, mindfully, uh, than I would have had I not practiced meditation or asana. Mm. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Um, I'm curious. To, so you answer this a little. I'm curious if she ever got into a con- disconnected state with body, mind, and spirit. Uh, what has she done to reconnect? So I think you pretty much answered that. Um, has she ever felt disconnected from her practice? So yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. From the very beginning, what I've learned about the practice of asana. Mm-hmm. Is that there? Are, there are plateaus, ebbs and flows, you know, over the years. Um, so there are moments where my practice every day I get on the mat and I'm on fire. My body is open and I'm feeling the light and I'm feeling the love. And then there are long periods of time where I feel nothing. Mm-hmm. My body aches. It won't release. It won't go deeper. I'm clunky and falling out of my poses. I have no real sense or depth of spirit. And, but what I've learned over the years is not to get attached to either. Just get on the mat and do your practice because it always changes. So those plateaus become these amazing hills and valleys. And then those hills and valleys become these plateaus. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't change. I just get on my practice and whatever I receive that day, I receive. And I don't have an attachment to it being transcendent or not. I just breathe and do my practice. Um, 
when I'm feeling dry or disconnected, I look for resources that can bring me inspiration. For me, it's usually people like Marianne Williamson, for example, people who are thought leaders who do a lot of work with prayer. Sri Aurobindo and the Mother are uh, two resources also that will usually give me a little jolt, a little perspective, help me get out of my head. Um, when my father was dying, that was a very difficult time for me in my yoga practice because I already felt everything and my yoga practice actually exasperated that. And I was it made me too sensitive, too heightened. My yoga mat scared me a little bit because I, I needed a boundary from, in some ways, what was happening in real time in my yoga practice. It was almost too much. And I had to, my yoga practice during that period became very restorative. The more intense asana I did, the more overwhelmed I was with my emotion. The more re restorative I did, the more I was able to regulate my central nervous system and be more available to what was happening to me, to my dad, and to my family um, without being overstimulated. And so there's just changes that one has to adapt to within the yoga practice and not get attached to thinking that it's supposed to look one way or another. Um, for the most part, you know, I'm... I practice daily. My yoga practice is, like I said, a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. uh, if I didn't practice yoga, I know without a doubt my intensity would take over and my intensity unchecked makes me an asshole and very quickly <laughs> um, because my intensity comes from a place of where there's a lot of injustice, a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. And because I'm not passive, I'm aggressive mm -hmm. and uh, I, it feels justified in the moment when I'm triggered. And I go on the, uh, you know, I go for the attack. Yeah. And that doesn't serve anything. And it happens so quickly. And it feels so correct in my body because it's just old stuff that it's difficult for me to see in the moment that I'm actually the one who's being reactive and at fault. So when I practice yoga, I can hold myself accountable. I can identify my triggers. I can breathe and be present in conflict and make healthier choices. So my practice, whether it is fluid and fantastic or just in that plateau state, mm -hmm. regardless, I get on the mat because I know that I'm going to engage in the world in a more healthy way as a result. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Um, you know, I, I love what you're saying about this idea that, you know, not always a really powerful practice is what's needed. And that sometimes a powerful practice can bring up these feelings of overwhelm as instead of creating this calming effect that a restorative practice can offer. I think a lot of times we forget that. We think, mm -hmm. oh, I have to practice this way all the time. And not the case. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what else we got here. So that question was from Mara Barrett. Um, okay, so Lindsay. So she has several questions. I'll try to pick one. <laughs> um, okay. So I recently did I recently did a vlog about my five, top five books. Um, so she's curious, uh, maybe a couple of books that are your like go to books or that you recommend for yogis or you know just people mm -hmm. wanting to transform their lives. Sure, um, two books by Anadaya Judas, mm -hmm. The Wheels of Life and Eastern Body Western Mind. Um, Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Mm -hmm. Franny and Zoe by uh, J D Salinger. Um, mm -hmm. The Stava Tree, uh, Sri Aurobindo. Um, uh, I love the book A Subtle Body by Sydney Dale. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, Cindy Dale. Um, and what else? I think that right, I think that's a lot right <laughs> there that I can think of. Yeah. Um, Carolyn Mace, Anatomy of the Spirit, was a really influential book for me back in the day. Did, um, you, did you do some studying with? With Carolyn? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. for years. Because once yeah. I started reading her stuff, I was like, oh, I like saw yeah. a lot of those connections. And I worked yeah. for her for a while, too. Oh, okay. I, I, Yeah, my job at, at a time, she did these things called uh, these continuing educations. she gave these lectures, and my job was to listen to her. And then twice a day, I would take her students and uh, teach them yoga and mm -hmm. take her themes and embody it. Mm -hmm. and uh, help the students to, because her information is so, you know, it's deep and it's intense and it's academic. And so she wanted it embodied. So it was a real, uh, an education for me of, first of all, having to be present to her languaging, 
her intention and then to find a way to translate it into something that was more ritualized and it was very influential in how I worked even today, why I'm able to simultaneously teach an asana class while bringing in these other themes and landing the themes into the body. So uh, I did that with her for years. Yeah, I, I, it's, yeah. as soon as I started reading that, I could, I could see that, that connection, totally. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's see, she has another. Okay, so um, is there somewhere that you haven't been in the world that is on your dream list? Yeah, Morocco. And uh, that's where I'm going to be. And in 2016, I'm going to be turning 50, and that's where I'm going to go for my 50th birthday. It's Morocco. Nice. My father was raised in Morocco. He's an American, but he was raised there. And um, so I've always had a real pull to that part of the world. And so that's uh, Israel was on my, uh, on my top list, but I, I did that this past year. And um, now it's uh, Morocco. You know, I've been really fortunate. Each, I'm a huge, I've had Wonderlust since I was <laughs> uh, 17 years old. And um, I've been really fortunate to have visited many, many countries. And with the work that I do, each year I usually pick one or two brand new countries that I've never been to before. This year I went to Nic Nicaragua. Next mm -hmm. month I'm going to Australia. I've never been there before. And um, I'm very ex like I love having that opportunity to be able to go into these cultures to learn a little bit more about you know who they are, what their traditions are, what their needs are, mm -hmm. um, what the politics are. Like I find it just so uh, fascinating. Always have. So Morocco, I'm I cannot wait for this trip. I'd love to go to Egypt too. I, I don't yeah. feel comfortable going there right this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but one day I hope that the situation changes there and it's a little safer. And that would definitely be a place that I would want to go visit. Wow, awesome. Uh, what did you think about Nicaragua? We actually built uh, our two schools there last year with uh, you know with the stuff that we do, Maura and I. Um, how did you like it there? I love Nicaragua. It was yeah, great. Beautiful. I mean, I was partial to Nicaragua because where I went was called Little Corn Island. <laughs> oh, and, yes, I saw that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I like to fancy it that I have my very own island. And I had been wanting to go there a long time. I actually had wanted to get married on that island. It, I thought it would be really fun to have my family come to Little Corn. And that's where I would have my, uh, my wedding. Yeah. And uh, when they, but there, were no, there was nothing there. I mean, There's no cars. There. You have to yeah. get there by boat. And uh, so when they opened up a retreat center there right mm -hmm. on the ocean, I was like, sign me up. Yeah. So I, ha I loved it. I didn't get a real... I didn't get to really go into the heart of Nicaragua and understand yeah. the culture, but I, w I intend to go back nice. and get a better sense of it in the future. Awesome. Um, so I have another question for you. Um, I saw uh, in, in your bio that you have a, a book that you're writing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk at all about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, i to hear about it. Yeah, it's, it's a horrifying, miserable experience, <laughs> and I highly recommend no one ever take that pro pro project on. It's tough. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... um. I've been meaning to write a book for a really long time, and I just haven't really carved out the space for it. I still haven't carved out the space for it, but I signed a contract, so I have no choice. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. It's a yes, lot it of, and it brings, I mean, I'm, you know, 100 pages into a memoir. It takes, brings a lot of stuff up when you're, yes. when you're writing a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I feel like I'm a little ahead of the curve in some ways. In the past, the past two and a half years, I've been working on this very massive DVD program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a three-program deal called The Yoga of Awakening. And when it's all said and done, there'll probably be 30 hours of content and a lot of interviews. And mm -hmm. in that process of the interviews, we've transcribed a lot of it. And when I break it down and I look at it all, I see my book in there. And I haven't decided yet. My book will either be one book or it'll be three books. Mm -hmm. And dealing with, if it's three books, it'll break things down in three very specific sections. Um, ultimately, it'll all lead towards purpose, transformational work, social justice, and you know, how we as a collective uh, can be a grassroots movement uh, to create change and what that looks like. And the other books will be basically the idea of what we have to do to change ourselves, where that internal revolution begins in order to be, to be prepared to be a part of the collective. And um, so I haven't decided yet whether it's going to be one book or three. Um, mm -hmm. I, I definitely, in the same way the DVDs became a they weren't supposed to be as big as it was. Yeah. This would be two hours, and that's 30. <laughs> and uh, I have a feeling the book might evolve the same way. Mm -hmm. And so right now I'm just in the process of collecting information, starting to organize it. This year coming up, uh, I'm going to be taking some time off of my travel schedule for the first time in actually 18 years. I'm going to go off the road for a while and mm -hmm. make myself a little less available than I've 
than I've been and so that I can go inside and start to really reflect and look back at the last 20 years of my life and ask myself, what have I learned and how have I assimilated this and what's important for me to put out and what can my contribution be and how is my voice, uh, how do I find my voice within this process uh, so that the book isn't just a... um, isn't just a random collection of information that's already out there. That it it it's has uh, it might be the same information, but it's being translated through my particular and sometimes peculiar uh, <laughs> way of seeing the world. And so I need to be in the right headspace to be able to channel that. And so I'm going to take some time off next year so that I can be really available to the process. Nice. Well, I'm very looking forward to reading that book. I'm sure a lot of people are. So well. We'll keep thank our you. ears pure for that. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you so much. That was super fun. And um, yeah, those questions were pretty good. So that, mm-hmm. that good responses there. Um, so everyone, thank you so much for uh, for your questions. Uh, make sure you leave any comments below, any additional questions. And um, I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much, Sean. You're so welcome. Right, mm-hmm. Thank you. Bye. Get ready to rock your purpose. Registration for my new course, Rock Your Purpose, is now open. Want to learn more? Check out the link below.